The following learning module will provide a foundation for the basic interpretation of Rotem test results and the clinical application of these results to aid in the management of perioperative bleeding. The educational objectives for this module are as follows. Understanding the benefits of the viscoelastic testing versus traditional lab tests. Understand the rotational thromboelastometric for Rotem method. Understanding current offering of Rotem assays. Understand how to read Rotem graph information and measured parameters. Then, to understand the clinical application of Rotem in perioperative bleeding management. And finally, to understand how to use the interpretation guides and other tools that are available at the clinical point of care. A question you may have is, what is thromboelastography or thromboelastometry? The terms are synonymous and simply refer to the assessment of the quality of a blood clot by measuring its elastic properties. This test actually predates the APTT and was developed by Professor Hartert in Germany in the 1940s and first reported in 1948. Once again, the test measures the viscoelastic or tensile strength of a blood clot. It therefore demonstrates when a clot forms and the rate at which it forms, the maximum firmness and stability, and signs of clot lysis or breakdown. It is also important that the blood sample measured with Rotem is a whole blood sample and does not only analyze the plasma component. Hemostasis is the balance between a condition of bleeding and clotting. In vivo, the body resorts to a multifaceted approach to maintain this balance. The natural balance of hemostasis involves whole blood and incorporates the elements of pro-coagulation factors, anticoagulation factors, cellular components, and normal lysis mechanisms. This is why it is important to analyze hemostatic imbalance using whole blood samples. Traditional laboratory-based tests, such as a PTINR or APTT, provide an assessment of only part of the whole blood sample, the plasma component. Therefore, it is only demonstrating the influence of plasma-based procoagulant and anticoagulant factors, which complete only part of the picture. These tests provide limited information about disorders of fibrin polymerization or clot propagation. They are not sensitive to the effect of activated factor 13 or clot lysis or breakdown. They also do not demonstrate the interactions of other cellular components that occur in vivo that play important roles in balancing hemostasis. And lastly, plasma-based tests do not reflect the overall strength or firmness of a clot once it has formed. As a further demonstration of the limited information provided in plasma-based PTINR and APTT tests, we can see that these tests reflect only the amount of thrombin generation required to signal the onset of clotting. Beyond this point, we can see that the thrombin continues to be generated, which converts fibrinogen to fibrin, which is fibrin polymerization. These fibrin monomers then interact with platelets and activated factor 13 to build or propagate larger and stronger clot. In this graph, you can see that as the clot develops, it increases in elasticity. A defect in one or more components of clot formation would potentially not be reflected in a PTINR or APTT test. The technology used in rotum testing is done on a precision instrument called the rotum delta. This delta allows for testing of four samples at a time is relatively automated with regard to the testing procedure, has simple and intuitive touchscreen operation, and provides easy to understand graphic and written instructions with each test, allows for weekly liquid quality control, and has a convenient barcode scanner. The Rotom Delta is really a self-contained system that is easy to operate and maintain regulatory compliance for 24-7 readiness. It is called rotational thromboelastometry because the pin rotates within a fixed cup. Our unique system is precise and is sensitive to clot formation without being sensitive to vibration, imbalance, and movement that can disrupt the classic TEG method. Because bleeding in the clinical setting is often multifactorial, Rotem offers a panel approach to evaluate hemostasis imbalance and to guide transfusion therapy. Therefore, by using a unique combination of activators and inhibitors, Rotem can demonstrate impaired thrombin generation, poor clot firmness, and premature lysis in the bleeding patient 
as well as provide a relative estimate of hemostatic reserve or hypercoagulability in patients that are not bleeding. The ROTEM panel approach starts by looking at pathway-specific deficiencies of the coagulation cascade. The INTEM assay evaluates the enzymatic factors of the intrinsic pathway, for example, factors 12, 11, 9, and 8, and those continuing through the common pathway, for example, factors 2, 10, 5, and 13. This pathway will also be sensitive to the anticoagulation effects of heparin. The XTEM assay evaluates the enzymatic factors of the extrinsic pathway, for example, factor 7, and those continuing through the common pathway, for example, factors 2, 10, 5, and 13. This pathway represents those factors that are vitamin K dependent. One of our modified base tests is the FibTem. This test is extrinsically activated but blocks the platelet contribution to the clot and therefore directly measures only the fibrin contribution to the clot formation and indirectly measures fibrinogen availability. The current available ROTEM assays used to provide the differential diagnosis of hemostatic imbalance are as follows. The INTEM via intrinsic activation using elagic acid. The XTEM via extrinsic activation using tissue factor. One modification of INTEM is the HEPTEM. By adding heparinase to the intrinsically activated test, HEPTEM neutralizes the heparin within the sample and can provide information about patient's ability to clot after heparin reversal and is also used to confirm that a defect demonstrated in the INTEM test is due to heparin anticoagulation and not due to a factor deficiency. The previously mentioned FibTEM assay is a modification of XTEM. The addition of cytochalasin D is used to inhibit platelet contribution to the clot formation. The resulting amplitude, therefore, only reflects the quality of the clot due to the fibrin contribution. The tests directly measure fibrin activity, which can also provide an indirect measurement of fibrinogen availability. The APTEM assay is also a modification of the XTEM. In this test, the addition of an antifibrinolytic agent can provide early confirmation of hyperfibrinolysis, or premature clot breakdown, when compared to a non-modified XTEM test. APTEM also provides information as to how well a patient will respond to antifibrinolytic therapy and if further transfusion therapy will be required. Let's now look at how we begin to interpret the results we get from the ROTEM analysis. ROTEM provides for quantitative and qualitative analysis to aid in the differential diagnosis of hemostatic imbalance and coagulation disorders. With ROTEM, you will receive a graphic display, the temogram, and numerical values that may be compared to established reference ranges. A graphic displaying the temogram and its measured parameters is seen here on the lower left of the slide, and the table of U.S. reference ranges associated with each measured parameter is displayed here on the lower right. We will now discuss these two elements of interpretation in more detail. Let's begin by describing how to interpret the temogram, or the tem tracing, as it develops. The temogram develops on a graph which measures the increase in amplitude, which relates to clot firmness over a period of time in which results are measured in seconds. Overall, the greater the amplitude of the tracing indicates greater firmness or strength of the blood clot. Also, each graph will indicate which assay is being run. In this example, it is the INTEM assay. To aid in the rapid visual assessment of the quality of a clot, the graph adds visual markers such as green broken lines at the 40 millimeter mark. This provides simply a reference point to compare with the actual amplitude that is developed. Even the blood clot tracing is broken down by parameter to provide a better color visual indication of the different phases of clot development. For example, the CT parameter is colored in green. This indicates an amplitude generation of less than 2 millimeters. These parameters will be described in more detail shortly. The next parameter, the CFT, represents the phase of fibrin polymerization, or the rate of clot formation. This is measured in the range of 2 to 20 millimeters and is indicated by the pinkish color. Beyond the 20 millimeter point, the increasing amplitude demonstrating further clot firmness is displayed in the dark blue color. By using the visual cues and looking at the shape of the graph, you can determine, for example, whether a clot is firm and stable, is unstable, 
or unsustainable, indicating premature lysis, or is simply weak or fragile. One of the advantages of the Rotem system is ability to make differential diagnosis very quickly by understanding what a normal and abnormal tracing will look like. One can see how the following examples can demonstrate how a determination can happen in about 10 minutes after starting the test. All of these examples are assuming a patient is exhibiting clinically significant bleeding. In the first example, a 10-minute assessment of XTEM, INTEM, and FibTEM all demonstrate normal-looking clotting times and amplitude at A10. Therefore, in this scenario, one may consider that the patient is not bleeding due to a coagulopathy, but due to a surgical bleeding issue. For example, inadequate mechanical hemostasis due to suture line issue or missing vessel ligature, etc. In the next example, XTEM is normal. INTEM demonstrates a prolonged CT and FibTEM shows normal amplitude at A10. To determine the reason that the CT in INTEM is prolonged, a HEPTEM was performed. The normalization of the tracing in HEPTEM as compared to INTEM confirms that it was a heparin effect. In the third example, both XTEM and INTEM demonstrate prolonged CFT and lower amplitude at A10. To differentiate whether the problem was due to low platelets or low fibrinogen, a FibTEM was performed. The FibTEM then demonstrated adequate fibrin contribution to the clot, and therefore, the suggestion is that platelets are needed. In the last example, similar to the previous example, both XTEM and INTEM demonstrate prolonged CFT and lower amplitude at A10. To differentiate whether this problem was due to low platelets or low fibrinogen, a FibTEM was again performed. The FibTEM now demonstrates inadequate fibrin contribution to the clot, and therefore, the suggestion is that fibrinogen supplementation, as with cryoprecipitate, is needed. Now, let's look at the individual measured parameters, their significance, and their associated reference ranges. The Rotem Delta provides several measured parameters during the course of an analysis. Specifically, they are the following. The first parameter is the CT, or clotting time. This demonstrates the onset of clot formation and is measured in seconds. The second parameter, the CFT, or clot formation time, demonstrates the rate at which the clot forms. This is also measured in seconds. The alpha angle, measured in degrees, is tangent to the clotting curve from 2 millimeters. This provides an overall indication of a hyper or hypocoagulable state. Early amplitude parameters A10 and A20 provide amplitude at 10 to 20 minutes after CT. All amplitude parameters are measured in millimeters. The MCF, or maximum clot firmness, demonstrates the maximum strength of the clot and is also measured in millimeters. LI30 is the lysis index, or percentage of clot remaining 30 minutes after CT, and the ML, or maximum lysis, is the percentage of total lysis at any point during the test. So you can see that there are several parameters that are developed during the Rotem analysis. However, there are only a few that are really necessary for the management of most perioperative bleeding events. These are the CT, the A10, and the ML. We shall spend more time discussing these in more detail. The CT, again measured in seconds, reflects the patient's ability to generate thrombin sufficient to result in the onset of clot formation. This is also dependent on sufficient availability of fibrinogen for thrombin to cleave to fibrin. The amplitude parameters, such as A10, an early indicator of maximum clot firmness, are measured in millimeters and reflect the firmness and stability of a clot, for example, interaction of platelets, fibrin, and activated factor 13. The lysis parameters LI30 and ML, measured in percentage, reflects the presence of premature clot lysis or hyperfibrinolysis. The CT is established by measuring the time it takes from the point blood and reagent mix until the early clot starts to develop, resulting in 2 millimeters of amplitude. As the first parameter to develop, the CT is then the first parameter to be evaluated. Here we can see the reference ranges for the CT in the INTEM and XTEM tests that are associated with a normal result. Again, the CT provides information about the patient's ability to generate thrombin and information about the effects of heparin within the INTEM test or pathway-specific enzymatic factor deficiencies in the INTEM or XTEM tests.
Evaluation of the CT is important for guiding protamine administration for heparin reversal, PCC administration for rapid reversal of oral vitamin K antagonists, or the transfusion of fresh frozen plasma as a source of enzymatic coagulation factors. The clot formation time is developed by measuring the time it takes from the end of CT formation at 2 mm to reach an amplitude measurement of 20 mm of clot strength. Consider this as a demonstration of the rate of clot propagation. The reference ranges of each test for a normal result are displayed here. After evaluating the CT to assess thrombin generation, the next important parameters to evaluate are the amplitude parameters A10, A20, and MCF, maximum clot firmness. These demonstrate clot firmness, which is primarily reflecting the quality of the clot, for example, the fibrin platelet and activated factor 13 complexes. By looking at the early parameter A10, we can make a rapid and highly predictive assessment of the maximum clot firmness at a much earlier point, which can lead to earlier targeted therapeutic interventions. Looking at specifically the A10 parameter, we can see that it develops 10 minutes after CT, or onset of clot formation. This again is a much faster indicator of MCF. The targeted reference range for both intem and extem should fall between 40 and 60 millimeters if the clot is relatively strong and stable. And by comparing the A10 to the MCF as demonstrated in the tracing, we can see that the MCF parameter develops much later, about 15 minutes in this example, than the A10. The reference values associated with normal clot firmness for the MCF are about 10 millimeters higher and the A10 reference value. Therefore, it may be easier to remember A10 plus 10 as a reliable way to predict the MCF of a clot. The early amplitude parameters are even important in the evaluation of the MCF of the FibTem result. Normally, there is very little change after about 5 minutes of testing and almost none after the establishment of A10 in FibTem. This means that it is possible to obtain a very rapid assessment of the fibrin polymerization during acute bleeding events. The predictive value of using the early amplitude parameters to predict the MCF in Rotom has been studied by several institutions. Notably, Klaus Gorlinger and colleagues from the University of Essen in Germany looked at this in a large retrospective analysis. This table displays the results from a rock curve analysis of well over 3,000 tests in XTEM. APTEM, FIBTEM, and INTEM. The goal was to look at how predictive each early Rotom parameter was relative to an MCF of 50 millimeters for XTEM, APTEM, and INTEM, and of an MCF of 9 millimeters in FIBTEM. What they were able to demonstrate was that all early parameters were quite predictive of the MCF with the exception of the CT. Looking specifically at the A10 values, we can see a good demonstration of predictability within the area under curve, p-value significance, and specificity and sensitivity results. Here we can see the average bias of the early amplitude parameters at A10 to the MCF. The average bias for intem and XTEM was 10 mm, and the FibTEM was 3.5 mm. This study reflects what has been demonstrated in other published literature, as well as during clinical evaluations here in the U.S., the third major parameter to evaluate when managing perioperative bleeding is the ML parameter, or maximum lysis. The ML parameter is an ever-developing parameter that reflects the percentage of clot degradation from the highest amplitude point to any point during the test, or T equals X, X being at any given time. It is helpful because the possibility of positively identifying hyperfibrinolysis can happen at any point during the test with this measured parameter. In this example, we can see how the ML would develop during the measurement of a clot demonstrating hyperfibrinolysis. At 20 minutes, the clot has degraded by about 3%. At 25 minutes, there is an ML of 40%. At 30 minutes, 80% and there is 100% clot lysis at 33 minutes. With Rotom analysis, hyperfibrinolysis is positively identified if there is 15% of more clot lysis within one hour. So in this example, that threshold was demonstrated between 20 and 25 minutes. Also, consider that in patients with severe trauma, an early ML of greater than 3% can be associated with increased mortality as demonstrated in recent literature.
Applying this information in the clinical setting is simply a matter of looking at the right combination of tasks and parameters to evaluate thrombin generation of clot initiation, clot stability, and early lysis. Within this presentation and throughout the literature, you will see the combination of assays and parameters written in different ways. Here are two examples. Both are referencing the CT parameter in XTEM. Let's review some of the influencing factors that affect certain parameters and assays. The CT of INTEM and XTEM will be influenced by the pathway-specific enzymatic factors, or potentially heparin in INTEM. Also, remember that in cases of severe hypofibrinogenemia, the CT can also be prolonged. The A10 of INTEM and XTEM value will be influenced by the clot firmness as a result of fibrin platelets and activated factor 13. The A10 of FibTEM will be influenced by the activity of the fibrin as it contributes to the clot stability. The ML of INTEM, XTEM, or FibTEM will reflect the amount of clot lysis during the length of the test run. Understanding the influences on these parameters will then allow us to understand what it means should the analysis result in abnormal values. A prolongation of the CT in INTEM and or XTEM will reflect an impairment in the ability to generate thrombin or as with INTEM, can reflect the influence of heparin anticoagulation. In these cases, hypofibrinogenemia should also be considered. A reduction of A10 in INTEM and or XTEM value will be due to inadequate clot firmness as a result of either low platelets or low fibrin activity, or both in extreme cases. A reduction of A10 in FibTEM will be due to inadequate activity of the fibrin contribution to the clot, an ML of 15% or more during the test run or a trend towards that in INTEM, XTEM, or FibTEM will positively indicate hyperfibrinolysis. Combining what we have learned about interpreting the graphic tracing, or temogram, with knowledge of the parameters, assays, and the influencing factors affecting them, we can begin to apply this to testing in the clinical setting. First, it is important to recognize what normal looks like. In the examples shown of test results for INTEM, XTEM, and FibTEM on a patient sample, we can quickly assess that there is normal thrombin generation because of relatively short CTs, good rate of clot formation, and amplitudes well into the 50 mm range in INTEM and XTEM, and about 10 mm in FibTEM. Also, a normal HEPTEM will look like a normal INTEM, and a normal APTEM will look like a normal XTEM. If these results were demonstrated in a patient that had clinically significant bleeding, the cause would likely be of a surgical nature or due to a condition that is not detectable with ROTEM analysis. Now, let's look at several examples of how ROTEM is used to help manage patients with clinically significant bleeding. For this bleeding patient, a ROTEM analysis was run using the INTEM assay. As we can see from the first developing parameter, the CT, there is a prolongation indicating impairment in thrombin generation. This can be due to either an enzymatic factor deficiency or possibly heparin since it is affecting the intrinsic pathway. The decision was made to run a HEPTEM test to determine if this was due to heparin effect or a factor deficiency. The HEPTEM provides some clarity in this case. A corrected CT in HEPTEM compared to a prolonged CT in INTEM positively identifies the heparin effect. Therefore, in this case, additional heparin reversal would be beneficial. In this next example of a patient exhibiting clinically significant bleeding, the XTEM analysis demonstrates a slow developing clot. Looking at the CFT and very low amplitude, the A10 value is only 27 millimeters. If you recall from the reference range discussion, the A10 parameter that exhibits a firm clot is normally in the range of 40 to 60 millimeters. So a result of 27 millimeters reflects a very weak clot. To determine whether the weak clot is due to hyperfibrinogenemia or thrombocytopenia, a FibTEM test is performed. By looking at the A10 value of FibTEM, we can see that the result is only 4 millimeters. This is well below the range associated with a normal fibrin clot strength of 7 to 24 millimeters. In fact, in actively bleeding patients, an A10 value of above 9 millimeters or higher is associated with levels sufficient to restore hemostasis. In this case, fibrinogen supplementation with cryoprecipitate would be beneficial.
In this similar example of a patient exhibiting clinically significant bleeding, the XTEM analysis again demonstrates a slow developing clot by looking at the CFT and very low amplitude. The A10 value is again only 27 millimeters, and again, to determine whether the weak clot is due to low fibrinogen or platelet dysfunction, a FibTEM test is performed. By looking at the A10 value of FibTEM, in this case, we can see that the result is 9 millimeters. This is within the range associated with a normal fibrin clot strength of 7 to 24 millimeters. It is true that certain clinical situations may require targeting the FibTEM value more toward the higher end of the reference range, such as greater than 18 millimeters in heavy active bleeding. This will be discussed in more detail later in this module. However, in cases of non-acute microvascular bleeding, such as in this example, a FibTEM of 9 millimeters should be adequate and a platelet transfusion would prove beneficial. In this example, the patient is bleeding because the clot is not sustainable. We can see after about 20 minutes evidence of early clot lysis. The ML at 20 minutes is about 4% and at 23 minutes the ML is 30%. A 15% or greater ML value is a positive indicator for hyperfibrinolysis. When the APTEM test is run, you can see that the hyperfibrinolysis is corrected in the sample. This may indicate how the patient will respond to antifibrinolytic therapy and whether additional transfusion therapy might be required. This example is of a post-op cardiac surgery patient experiencing moderate bleeding. Looking at the CT in INTEM, we can see that it is prolonged at 293 seconds. Considering the cause is either heparin or a factor deficiency, a HEPTEM test may be performed. In this case, we can see that the CT in HEPTEM is shorter than the CT in INTEM, which therefore confirms the prolongation in INTEM is due to heparin. Therefore, this patient would benefit from additional heparin reversal. Looking at the CT in XTEM, we can see that there is a slight prolongation which may be due to a deficiency of vitamin K-dependent factors. However, this may not cause clinically significant bleeding. Looking at the A10 value of FibTEM, we can see a good example of a very strong fibrin contribution to clot firmness. Here, the A10 is 26 millimeters, which is already above the upper end of the range, associated with a normal level of fibrin activity required for strong clot formation. In another example of post-operative bleeding following a cardiac surgery, we can see a significant prolongation of the CT in INTEM. A corrected CT in HEPTEM confirms that this is due to heparin and additional heparin reversal would be indicated. Looking at the A10 of FibTEM, we see it demonstrates good amplitude of 13 millimeters and the A10 parameters in both HEPTEM and XTEM, measuring 47 and 46 millimeters respectively, also demonstrate overall good clot firmness. So it is clear from the ROTEM analysis that only further heparin reversal would be indicated. In this next example, the patient is undergoing cardiopulmonary bypass and has received heparin anticoagulation. This is evident due to the inability of the CT to form in NTEM and is confirmed in the HEPTEM test. Of course, this is a desired and predictable effect for this procedure. So the value of performing a rotum analysis at this point, in the procedure that is, pre-termination of CPB is not really to look at the INTEM, but to consider how the patient will look after heparin reversal in the HEPTEM and also the XTEM and FibTEM tests, which are unaffected by heparin concentrations of up to approximately 5 units per ml. And so we can see that in both the HEPTEM and XTEM, the CFT parameters are quite prolonged and the A10 values of 21 and 22 millimeters respectively are quite low. Therefore, there will be a very weak forming clot after termination of bypass and heparin reversal. By then considering the FibTEM assay, we can see that there is very little fibrin contribution to the clot. This provides an early indication that fibrinogen supplementation will be required to restore hemostasis post bypass. In this case, ROTEM provides the therapeutic guidance to transfuse cryoprecipitate to start and reassess if clinical bleeding continues. It is important to state that the ROTEM reference ranges were determined from reference group samples with no signs of impaired coagulation. These values are for orientation purposes only. Reference ranges for coagulation parameters depend on the reference population, the blood sampling technique, and other pre-analytical factors.
it is recommended to confirm the ranges with a hospital-specific reference group. Therefore, it is important to also state that reference values do not equate to trigger values in all cases. Targeted values for therapeutic interventions may be higher than the lower threshold of the reference range, particularly in severely bleeding patients. The targeted value may be at the upper threshold of the reference range. For example, in severely bleeding patients, the A10 value in FibTem of 18 to 22 millimeters, not only 7 to 10 millimeters, may be necessary to stop microvascular bleeding, especially in PPH, severe trauma, and aortic surgery. One must consider the clinical situation, for example, the nature of injury or procedure, and the rate of bleeding in order to formulate the appropriate targeted ranges to guide therapeutic intervention. After some experience using Rotom, this will become more intuitive. There will also be cases such that the parameters may demonstrate results lower than the reference range without the evidence of clinically significant bleeding. In these cases, Rotom analysis can be used to indicate a relative risk of bleeding or a certain level of hemostatic reserve for the patient. Furthermore, in patients with severe trauma, already a ML greater than 3% can be associated with increased mortality and may justify treatment with tranexamic acid if not already administered prophylactically within three hours after the point of traumatic injury as suggested in recent trauma studies. Understanding the points where the relative risk of bleeding increases using Rotom analysis is important. The following table describes at what levels certain parameter endpoints may be associated with an increased bleeding risk. This should be considered in the event where there are conditions that create further hemostatic imbalance. Such conditions may occur if unchecked or occult bleeding continues, or if there is an infusion of volume required for hemodynamic stabilization that may further dilute the coagulation factors. The information on these tables is derived from a review of the clinical opinions of experienced physicians reporting their observations in a selection of current literature and is not a product of TEM Systems or TEM International. There are some key points to take away from this learning module. So, to summarize these, the first point is to recognize what normal results look like. Recognize normal CTs, clot propagation rates, and amplitude using visual cues and color designation to help. Beyond recognizing normal, it is important to keep the assessment of the analysis simple. Evaluate the CT to assess thrombin generation and use this to guide heparin reversal and or the use of FFP. Evaluate the A10 of Intem and Extem to assess clot firmness. Use the A10 of Fibtem to determine whether a weak clot is due to a deficiency of fibrin or platelets. Use the Fibtem to help guide supplementation of fibrinogen with cryoprecipitate or to give platelets to strengthen a weak clot in bleeding patients. Evaluate the ML to confirm hyperfibrinolysis and the benefit of antifibrinolytic therapy. Remember to treat symptoms and not numbers. Adjusting trigger points to meet the clinical condition takes time to learn and will come with experience. Use the guides and tools that are available. The Rotom Interpretation Guide Poster is a useful tool to display at the point of care or point of decision as an aid to interpreting Rotom results and to provide an easy visual reference of the basics of Rotom analysis. The Rotom Pocket Guide provides a quick reference for displaying reference ranges assay information, and examples of normal and abnormal results. This slide contains the clinical publication referenced in this educational presentation. This interpretation training presentation is intended to provide fundamentals for the interpretation of Rotom results and for the safe use of the Rotom Delta thromboelastometry system. This presentation is not intended to replace the need for additional medical education or textbook learning about this topic or other topics related to bleeding management. Results from the Rotom Delta should not be the sole basis for a patient diagnosis. Rotom Delta results should be considered along with a clinical assessment of the patient's condition and other coagulation laboratory tests. Thank you for reviewing this Rotem education module on the basics of interpretation. For more information about Rotem, please visit www.rotem.inc.com. Also, for more general information about the management of perioperative bleeding, please visit www.perioperativebleeding.org. Registration for online access to presentations is free.